Heavenly Father, we thank you for this beautiful day of life. Thank you for the many blessings that you have given to us and that you continue to pour upon us. Um, just be with, our, be with us and your Holy Spirit to open our hearts and minds to your word and be with those who could not be with us. Uh, Jean said she's not feeling well and there's other things going on in other people's lives. Just bless. Uh, thank you for working all things together to result good in us so that we can be ready to see you and stand before you when you come. Just bless us to this end. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Well, I hope you don't mind. I, I uh, wanted to share about the Feast of Tabernacles and I I sent you uh, some information on Psalm 118, because Psalm 118 is uh, about the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, since it is the Feast of Tabernacles right now, and uh, it will be for the next three or four days, um, I just thought it would be, would be appropriate to kind of talk about the Feast of Tabernacles um, wow. here, but... Uh, Anyway, I wanted to lay a foundation because I'm not sure how much people know or don't know. Um, so I wanted to kind of hear from you guys what you know about and go to different places in the scripture. You can read about the Feast of Tabernacles in Leviticus 23 when it de describes all the feasts. It's also called the Feast of Ingathering. It's also called the Feast of Booth. Um, so Leviticus 23 just describes all the feasts. And literally, um, it's called the Booth... The Feast of Booth, it's actually the word, Hebrew word is Succoth. Um, and you'll notice when they came out of Egypt and they crossed the Red Sea, they went, they went to Succoth. That's where they went. They were supposed to go and tabernacle with God is what they were supposed to do. But of course, uh, you know, they were interested in golden calf and other things. So they didn't uh, enter into the marriage relationship with God that God desired. So there was some wandering around the wilderness for a while. But um, so anyways, this, this feast is very interesting. Um, and it's not very well known for some reason uh, amongst us, but I th obviously I think it's time for us to understand it. So I hope did everybody get the the structure that I gave you with Psalm 118. I hope uh, we can talk yes. about it, we can understand it. Um, there's a couple of texts I wanted to give you. Uh, if you go to Deuteronomy 31. By the way, if you're taking notes, there's Leviticus 23, Numbers 28, and Deuteronomy 16. All three places uh, talk about the Feast of Tabernacles, the Feast of Booth. Um, it's mentioned many other places in the Bible, but that's where in the Torah it's described um, as the Feast of Ingathering. It's also called the Solemn Feast. It's the Feast of Harvest, but it's for the fall of the year. So the focus of the Feast of Tabernacles and the Harvest is the grapes the grapes and the wine, because um, it's a fall feast. If you go to Deuteronomy 31, uh, you'll notice that um, in verse 10, well, you start in verse 9, that's where it starts. Um, it says, Moses wrote this law, and he delivered it unto the priests of the sons of Levi, which bear the ark of the covenant of the Lord, and unto all the elders of Israel. And Moses commanded them, saying that at the end of every seven years, in the solemnity of the year, and of course, Feast of Tabernacles is called a solemn feast. So at the end of seven years, in the solemnity. Hi, Sharon. Hi. We're in Deuteronomy 31. I'm reading verses 9 and 10. So, so it says, at the end of the seven years, in the solemnity of the year of release, in the Feast of Tabernacles. So you'll notice a couple things that the Feast of Tabernacles is described as the end of the year. It's also connected with the year of release. That's the, that's the Jubilee. That's Leviticus 25. And then it says in the Feast of Tabernacles. So it says when all Israel is to come before to appear before the Lord thy God in the place which, which he shall choose, thou shalt read this law before all Israel in the hearing in their before all Israel in their hearing. And so there's to gather all the people together, and there was a public reading of the law, the public de declaration of the law. Um, so the Feast of Tabernacles is one of the feasts, that's the one time of the year that the, the people gathered together. They were to, remember, they were supposed to gather together three times a year. Uh, it was Passover and Pentecost, and then the Feast of Tabernacles, that was the three times that they were to, to meet. Actually, it was the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Every, every one of those times, it was a seven-day feast. 
Uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread is seven days. The Pentecost is seven days. And then, of course, the Feast of Booths or Ingathering is also seven days. Well, eight days, actually, for the Feast of Tabernacles, but as we shall see. But so the whole point here is that let, let me kind of put it together for you. So the Feast of Trumpets was a call to encounter God. It was a, it was a call of preparation to encounter God. And for the so the first day of the seventh month was the blowing of the trumpets. Uh, with, that's called Rosh Hashanah, the Feast of Trumpets. That lasts 10 days. The last day of that feast is actually the 10th day is the Day of Atonement. And that's the pre so the preparation of the first 10 days was to... Uh, make atonement or be, to become one with God through the day of atonement. At the, after the day of atonement, four days after the day of atonement is the Feast of Tabernacles. So on the 15th day of the month, that's the first day of the Feast of Tabernacles. And then that lasted seven days. So that's what the, that's the feast of the seventh month. Now the, the day of atonement was to become right with God, right? Our source, our, our, our sins would be, forgiven and cleansed and, and the, the the whole encampment would be clean and would we would be right with god and so that was the preparation for the marriage and that's what the feast of tabernacles represents the tabernacling together of the coming together of uh, god's people uh, with god so they would tabernacle together um, so it's it's significant that the the reading of the law is connected to the feast of tabernacles because actually the the, the law as you'll notice in this verse that the reading of the law is connected to the year of release or the proclamation of freedom because God's law is it's it's the perfect law of liberty according to james the old testament says it's, it's the law that sets us free right so if you function if we if we choose to function in harmony with god's law then we're free we're free from sin we're free from slavery we're free from sin and death and all the negative transgressions of god's law but see before before the day of atonement you and i weren't able to keep the law because we're sinful right so we were slaves to sin so god sets us free from our slavery and he atones for our sin of course with his own blood and then he restores us to rightness and now we can now we're free to keep the law and that's that's the freedom so there's a proclamation of god's law so that everybody hears the law and now that you're right with god and now that god has given provision through his sacrifice through his son he has given you provision so now you can keep the law so now you can tabernacle with god you can abide with god and god can abide in you his word can abide in you and you can abide with him so this is this the feast of tabernacles is connected to this marriage imagery so here in deuteronomy 31 that's where it talks about the public reading of the law the feast of tabernacles um there's many other things I could tell you, but if you go to Zechariah 14, well, actually, let me take you to Hosea first. Hosea 7, 5 and Hosea 9. There's some real interesting things here, that some questions that, that I had in my mind that the Lord answered that helped me come to these conclusions that I'll share with you. So if you go to Hosea chapter 7, and if I go too fast, just ask, ask questions or slow me down. I do want to get to the chiastic structure of Psalm 118. But Hosea 7, verse 5. If you're in the, if you're in the King James, it says, in the day of our king. Um, here in the NIV, it says, on the day of the festival of our king. Um, if you turn over to Hosea 9, verse 5, he says, what will you do in the solemn day? in the day of the feast of the lord so it's it's correct in 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 uh, hosea 7 when they talk about the day of the king that they connect it to the feast there's a feast day a specific day of the feast that's to, to the king but that's not really readily readily understood and i i you know always always wrestling trying to figure out what feast is he talking about when he talks about the feast to the king uh, which feast because none of the feast in leviticus talk about a king all seven of them, none of them talk about the king. And so when I went, that's when I brought you here before I go to Zechariah 14. Zechariah 14, he describes three times he talks about the Feast of Tabernacles. And he says in verse 16, it shall come to pass that everyone that is left of all the nations which came against Jerusalem 
shall even go up from year to year to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, and to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. It shall be that whosoever will not come up of all the families of the earth unto Jerusalem to worship the king, the Lord of hosts, even upon him there shall be no rain. If the family of Egypt does not go up and come not, they have no rain. There shall be the plague wherewith the Lord will smite the heathen that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. This is the punishment of Egypt and the punishment of all nations that come not up to keep the Feast of Tabernacles. So here, you know, Zechariah is almost, you know, he's repeating himself multiple times because he's trying to get something clear to us. What he's making clear is that the Feast of Tabernacles is actually the celebration where you go up to worship the king. And you'll notice um, the rain symbolism. Uh, we call it the latter rain, but the rain symbolism is connected to the Feast of Tabernacles and going up to worship the king. Um, so <clears throat> this was the answer to the riddle of Hosea in terms of the day of the Feast of the King. Which day, which feast day was that? What's the Feast of Tabernacles? And so the Feast of Tabernacles, um, there's, there's two major, major ceremonies that go along with the Feast of Tabernacles. By the way, Mrs. White has a whole chapter on this in Desire of Ages, and you can read it. It's very interesting. But uh, the two feasts, the two important commemorations or celebrations that take place in the Feast of Tabernacles is there's, there's a water ceremony and there's a light ceremony. Now, um, these things are made plain in John 7, the Gospel of John. Uh, John 7 talks about the feast. Jesus was going to, there was a Feast of Tabernacles, remember, and his brothers challenged him about going up to the feast to make himself public. What they were actually saying to Jesus is that it was the Feast of Tabernacles, and if he's truly the Messiah, then you need to go and present yourself publicly to Jerusalem as the king, and they'll proclaim you as the Messiah. Of course, Jesus was telling them his time was not yet, because Jesus knew uh, that when he presented himself to Jerusalem, to Israel as their king, that that would be his crucifixion. Um, his coronation was actually going to be his death. He understood these things, but of course, his brothers didn't. But What's interesting in the Gospel of John is that John 7, chapter 7, 8, 9, and, and 10 is all in the context of the Feast of Tabernacles. And so when you want to get a, a, a much clearer under, understanding of the Feast of Tabernacles, then you can read John 7, chapter John 7, John 8, John 9, and John 10. And in John 7, this is where Jesus said um, about the water ceremony, right? He said, all, come to me, all you who thirst and drink right out of your belly will flow rivers of living water he talked about the water and of course in john 8 uh, that's when he when he pointed to the sun and said i'm the light of the world and he started talking to them about being the light and of course john 9 is when he heals the blind man again and he starts talking about the light um so you see in in, in john the gospel of john when he presents the feast of tabernacles and john is the only one the only one of the gospel writers that does this that he presents the light ceremony and the water ceremony as significant in terms of the of the the declaration of Christ that he's the Messiah. Um, so, so this is what's important. Here's let me try to explain my conclusions from this, and you can then we can jump into Psalm 18. So, at the end of the Day of Atonement, when the sins are atoned for, that's when if you you can read in Leviticus 26, that's when the jubilee trumpet sounds. That's when the proclamation of freedom takes place it's at the end of the day of atonement but see the jews believe that they were going they would receive a good seal at the end of the, the day of atonement but the the jews knew that the, the jewish custom understanding was that even though the good seal came from the day of atonement they didn't receive the seal until the the, the last and greatest day of the feast of, of the feast of tabernacles because the good seal actually had to do with the marriage and the marriage wasn't complete or consummated until the feast of tabernacles um, in the Bible, as you know, uh, from the stories of Jacob, the wedding celebration, the, the wedding celebration took a whole week. And that's what the Feast of Tabernacles is. It's actually a wedding, uh, it's a wedding feast. And so um, that's why they did not receive the seal at the Day of Atonement, but they received it actually with the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, so is that a question yeah. or comment? Yeah. So the last day, was that the seventh or the eighth? Well, that's the point. There's seven, but there's really eight, right? Yeah. That's the, that's the thing. And that's what you see in John 7, right? 
the, the Leviticus says it's a seven day feast, but then on the eighth day of the feast, then, so you see the seven, but there's really eight. Um, by the way, this, this imagery carries over in Revelation, remember? I there's, there's, there's seven, the seven horns on the beast, but then there's the eighth. Yeah. Uh, same thing with Jesus walking amidst the seven golden candlesticks. There's seven candlesticks, but but really there's there's eight because he's the eighth, right? Mm -hmm. So so the seven individual actually come together to become one in Christ, and then so he's the eighth. So it's the same with the Feast of Tabernacles. There's seven days, but really there's eight. This is it's the, there's the mm -hmm. eighth day of the feast. So, you had mentioned you had mentioned that it to be a solemn occasion, but uh, it's to be a joyful occasion. That's right. So, so see, and that's the the mixing of the two. There, it's a solemn occasion because it's life, but it's yeah. a joy occasion because, of course, you'll see in our psalm, it's a joyous occasion for those who are who have been since have been atoned for and they're being married to the king. This is a joyous occasion, but for those. But for those who did not will not receive the king, then this is a solemn occasion because it's actually going to be uh, their destruction, as you'll will, will, as you'll see in the psalm. Um, it's the same thing we talk about the second coming of Christ, right? This is a joyous occasion. Well, for God's people, yeah, the second coming is a joyous occasion. But for the wicked, it's not a solemn. It's not a joyous occasion. So, so it's called a solemn feast at the same time it's called the festival of joy. Right, because it's, their sins are forgiven. They're 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 one with their Creator, and they're now they're being married to their God. So they're therefore this is a joyous occasion for those who have uh, who have celebrated the feast. Yeah. Now there's some other kingship imagery that are, is involved. In Leviticus as well as Deuteronomy and Numbers talk about the Feast of Tabernacles. They would take uh, three branches from th three different trees, and they would they would hold these branches. Right, it was part of the celebration. Of course, you're you know you're in Zechariah. We know Zechariah six and Zechariah three. You know what is that branch? What's the symbol? What's what's this branch a symbol of? Christ. Christ. It's the symbol of Christ. And what specifically about Christ is it a symbol of? Zechariah Zachar says he's the branch. That's right. Six, right. That's right. And so what? So what happens with the branch? Symbol of his kingship. That's right. So it says. So this is if you're in Zechariah six. Um, he says in verse eleven, take silver and gold and make crowns, and set them upon the head of Joshua the son of Heis Jehozadak the high priest. So what's happening here? He's being um, being coronated. He's yeah. being coronated. So the high priest the Jesus high priest. is being coronated as king, right? Then he says, speak. Right. Speak unto him, saying, Thus speak, speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, Behold, the man whose name is the branch. And you'll notice the word branch is in all capital letters. Yeah. Uh, that's signifying deity. Uh, throughout the Bible, you see that the, the words, um, and when they're all in caps like that, signifies deity. By the way, that's what's so significant in Revelation 17, when the harlot, she, uh, her letters are all in, in caps. She's claiming actually to be God. Uh, but that's, of course, a different topic. But hope. So here's the branch. He shall grow up out of his place. He shall build the temple of the Lord. So there's the tabernacle idea, building the tabernacle. And then it says again, even he shall build the temple of the Lord. And he shall bear the glory. And he shall sit and rule upon his throne. And he shall be priest upon his throne. And the council of peace shall be, shall be between them both. So what happens here is that at some point, according to Zechariah, um, the father is going to take Jesus, the high priest, he's going to place him on the throne and he's going to coronate him as king. And then that's the, that's when Christ becomes king. That and that begins actually um, the mixing of the end of the Day of Atonement and the, and the Feast of Tabernacles. He, he says there in uh, verse 13, and the, there'll be harmony between the two. The that's right. The merging. That's right. That's right. And that's the same idea. Remember, what was it was it Ezekiel or when he talks about the two rods and then the two rods become one, the two mm -hmm. branches, right? Because the see the reason why they're holding three branches from three different trees at the Feast of Tabernacles is because each of those branches represent Christ, but Christ has a three phase ministry. He's the suffering, <laughs> the prophet. Then he then he's the priest. 
and then he's the king. So they have three branches in their hand because the, it, it, those three branches actually describe all three ministries of the Messiah, right? So well, that's part of that's yeah. part of the Feast of Tabernacles imagery. And they would have a citrus fruit in there, I think, in their left hand. What would that yes. be representative? Well, it's the fruit. The the it's a harvest in gathering. So the fruit of the work of the Messiah, oh, wow. right? So we become we all become we all become demonstrations of the fruit of his ministry of his work. That's why it's a celebration of the in gathering, right? And so there's, um, you know. In Revelation 14, for for example, in Revelation 14, we talked about the three angels' messages. The the the, the in gathering is in terms of grapes. So we become the grapes that are harvested, right? Of course, there's a negative har there's a positive harvest and there's a negative harvest, right? So yeah, so the fruit is connected to the harvest in gathering. When they'd be waving those branches and holding the fruit, they'd be saying, Rosh Hashanah Habava, uh, Lord right. save us. That's right. That's right. And and so the so of course salvation is kingly, right? Hmm. Salvation is always kingly. And that's why it's so significant that they read the law at that time. Because remember, I, I've quoted this to you guys many times, but in Isaiah 33, 22, uh, of course, Isaiah is full of this imagery all over the place. Uh, but um, if you're turning to Isaiah 33 in verse 16, uh, verse 17 says, Thine eyes shall see the king in his beauty. And of course, he's going to use uh, this kingly imagery actually in terms of a river. And, and there's no ships, there's no merchant ships on this river. This river is a special river. Right? And uh, he says, verse 20, look upon Zion, the city of our solemnities. There's the solemnness of the feast. Thy night shall see Jerusalem, the quiet habitation, a tabernacle. There's the feast of tabernacles that shall not be taken down. No one of the stakes thereof shall be ever be removed. Neither shall any of the cords thereof be broken. But the, there the glorious Lord will be unto us a place of broad rivers and streams. Brandon, there's no galley or oars. There's no merchants. There's no exploiters here on this river, right? The merchants are exploiters in these ships. In, in the ancient world, the merchandise came from shipping. And so just like in Revelation 18, the shipmasters are part of this merchants of the earth that are exploiting people. But here on this river, there's no exploitation, right? Because he says, the Lord is our judge. The Lord is our lawgiver. The Lord is our king, and he will save us. So again, the, the, the reading of the law, the giving of the law is, in, is, is connected to the king. The king is the one who stands. He's the living demonstration of the law. And of course, He's also the judge, and he's also the savior. That's why he will save us. That's that's what Rosh Hashanah or Hosanna means, right? Save us. That's what they said to Jesus in Matthew 21 on the triumphal entry, right? And they were actually quoting, they're actually quoting Psalm 118. Uh, of course, we know that's one of the reasons we know that Psalm 118 is the psalm about the Feast of Tabernacles. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. Those, those two sticks in Ezekiel are in uh, Ezekiel 37, right after the Valley of Dry Bones. Yes, thank you. That's right. Um, so, so what I would like to do at this point is I would like to take you to Psalm 118 and then try to kind of walk through Psalm 118 so you can see uh, the imagery here. It's actually really beautiful. Um, and this psalm, this psalm was actually part of the liturgy of the feast in the temple so there was there was actually a, a liturgical reading just like we have a responsive reading sometimes in church of course it's usually from the hymnal it's not from the bible but but this responsive reading is actually comes from scripture so I, this is actually kind of neat but so you might want to turn to psalm 118 in your bible before I get started with the liturgy part of it, I'll just show you some things in the psalm that we know, that we can recognize. Um, you guys know about chiasm, chiastic structures by now. Most of you should know. You'll notice at the top of the chiastic structure in your in your paper, it, it's uh, actually verse 16a, right? The right hand of the Lord is exalted, right? That's the top of the chiastic structure. Well, that makes sense because the Feast of Tabernacles is about worshiping the king. 
And of course, the right hand of the Lord is Jesus, and he is being exalted to a place of kingship. And so that's what the, 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 the apex of the Caiusic structure is. Um, now, that there's many things in the psalm that point to that. The stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. That's also quoted uh, in Matthew um, 21. Uh, when with Jesus' triumphal entry, that's all about him becoming king. There's two stones there, right? There's the foundation stone that's at the base, and then there's the capstone. Um, the capstone is the keystone of the gate. So Jesus is the foundation stone. At the same time, he's the capstone. So um, that's a reference to Isaiah, and Peter mentions it. Uh, but so um, this is the day the Lord has made. That's, again, this is the day of the Lord. Um, blessed is he that comes in the name of the Lord. That's the, the very verse that they're, that they're recording in Matthew 21. Um, of course, save now, I beseech thee, O Lord. That's the Rosh Hashanah, save, salvation. The word there for save is Yeshua. That's actually Jesus' name. Mm -hmm. And then save now. Now is na. That's where you get Hashanah, uh, right? And then I beseech thee, O Lord, I beseech thee, send thee, send now prosperity. You'll notice this, there's all this now stuff going on because something has happening. Um, if you look at verse 14, the Lord is my strength and my song and is become my salvation. So he has become my Yeshua. He has become my Jesus or he's become our source of salvation. Um, it's the same thing in, in the other part of the Kai, verse 21, I will praise you for thou hast heard me and are become my salvation. So the reference to Yeshua or salvation here. Uh, in terms of the exaltation is very, very significant. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to read you the psalm, psalm how, it, how it would liturgically be read, right? So it starts out with verse, verse 1, Oh, give thanks to the Lord, for he is good, and his mercy endures forever. And then the congregation would respond, verse 29. His love endures, let's say, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, for he is good, his mercy endures forever. So they're responding. Now, you'll notice in the psalm that the emphasis for the Day of Atonement and the emphasis of the Feast of Tabernacles is on mercy. Now, this is significant because mercy triumphs over justice. Justice, right? What are, what are people in our society crying for? Justice. justice. What are they marching down the streets and burning buildings and all this? Stuff? What do they say? What do they say they want? Justice. Justice. Okay. So what sense does that make? Doesn't. Think of this. Different kingdom. Based on mercy. Yeah. No kidding. Right? Because, because all of us have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Right? So the wages of sin is what? Death. Yeah. So do we really want justice? Do we really want what's coming to us? No. no. Do we really want what's rightfully ours? No. No. No, no. So mercy. thanks to the Lord for he's good for his mercy. See, we cry for mercy. God's people are crying for mercy. The world is crying for justice, but they don't know what they're crying for. And actually, if that God would give them what they're actually asking, then they would die. Mm. By the way, you'll notice here at the end, look at the top of the chiastics of the structure of the psalm, right? It says the right hand of the Lord exalted. And it says the right hand of the Lord does valiantly. Well, look at the, the look at verse 17. What does it say? I shall not die but live. And declare, and declare the what? Lord. That's right. So the point here is I didn't get what I deserved. I got what he what, I got the blessing of the Lord because I deserve death. But he but I'm not going to die, I'm going to live. So there's a death resurrection experience connected to this encountering the king. Have we encountered that before? Have we talked about this before? Mm -hmm. yeah, notice in the midst of the psalm, the, psalm the, the congregation is responding, I shall not die, but I will live. It's because what, what was supposed to happen, if we receive justice, we would all die. Mm -hmm. But that's why we're pleading. That's why, that's why we're pleading, I beseech thee, O Lord, save me now, I beseech thee. Save me, right? Send me life. Give me life. Because I, I don't deserve life, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the beauty of the psalm. There's this be there's a lot of the beautiful theology wrapped up into this into this liturgy of the psalm. So so he so the the the, the first verse is said. Then the second then the second verse says, "Let Israel now say," 
And then the response the response is verse 28. So let Israel now say, and then the, the, the congregation will respond by saying verse 28. Thou art my God. God. And I will praise thee. Thou art my God. I will exalt thee. Right? So then after that, then he says, let the, let the house of Aaron now say, and then, then the congregation would respond. We have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. God is the Lord, which has showed us, which has showed us the light. With bow in hand, we join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. And there's your, there's your imagery of them holding the branches, the bows in hand. That's the Feast of Tabernacles imagery. Now, why is that significant? Because notice it says they, that they're blessed from, from the house of the Lord. At the end of the Day of Atonement, the high priest would go to the door of the sanctuary. He would raise both his hands... And he would pronounce the priestly blessing of number six, right? The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his mm -hmm. countenance and give you peace. And then, then it says that there and therefore he would put his he would put God's name on the people. See, that's the blessing from the house of God. The count God lifting up his countenance or shining his face upon us. That's what gives us light. That's what gives us life. That's what the light ceremony is, right? Mm -hmm. So this is the blessing that comes from the house of God. So here, when he talks about this blessing, uh, we beseech thee, we have blessed you out of the house of the Lord. That's the blessing he's talking about. That's why it's connected to the house of Aaron at the beginning. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, the, then the, the person was sorry again and said, let them that now fear the Lord, let them that fear the Lord now say. And then what they would say is, Blessed is, he who Blessed is he who comes in the name Lord. of the Lord. So you'll notice there's three parts that, of the congregation. Israel, what does the word Israel mean? Prevails with God. Yeah, it means the prince of God. That's right, he prevails with God. So the Israel of God deals with the princes or the, the leadership there. And then the house of Aaron, who's that? That's the priest, the Levites. That's the priest, that's the Levites. And then, then them that fear the Lord, who's that? The rest of the congregation. That's the rest of the congregation. So, so all three parts of the kingdom are making the statement, let this part of the kingdom now say. And then the response of the people is, and, and by the way, this is beautiful. That when Israel, when the princes say, let Israel now say, the response is, thou art my God. I will praise thee, thou art my God, and I will exalt thee. So the princes are not exalting themselves, they're exalting who? Mm. Their God. By the way, that's what I've been trying to share with you. When Christ takes the throne here at the Feast of Tabernacles, he, the emphasis is on his Godhead. He returns back to his place as God. Now, he was always God. He never ceased being God. But when he became a man, he laid aside his divinity and the privileges of his divinity to become a man to die for us but when he's exalted to to back to his throne he's exalted back to the place of authority he's placed on the throne he is he is god he's always been god god he's going to be worshiped as god when yeah. this comes he's god this is our god he has come to save us right Mm. Remember Thomas when he, when he he said, "My Lord and my God." After his resurrection, he realized he was God. See, that's what we need to realize that Jesus is God, right? So this is part of the Feast of Tabernacles, exalting mm. Christ to His rightful place. Yes, so that's just beautiful. That's just how beautiful. the whole great controversy started. That's right. That's right. This this is what mm. solves the issue of the great controversy. Mm -hmm. This is the revelation. I have a question. I was always told by my uncle that Psalms 118, verse 8, verse 9, somewhere in there, was actually chiastic for the whole Bible, in the center of the Bible. Hmm, that's, pro that's possible. I know the Bible has the many chiastic structures, right? That's right. I haven't, I haven't done the whole Bible yet, so maybe Jeff can take care of that. <laughs> <laughs> I that, would, that would be that would be some work to me earlier today. <laughs> but you'll notice, you see the second page I sent you. You'll notice that there's that, as you already know, if you're dealing with chiastic structures, there's chias, chiastic structures within chiastic structures. 
right? So this is a multi-level, that's why I use the onion analogy. Yeah, there's many chiasms. So verse seven through 13 of Psalm 118 is actually a mini chiastic structure that explains the stone the builders rejected has become the capstone. And it it's actually explains, um, well, many yeah. things, but so you can see there's chiasms within chiasms. So that's- hey, the cross there. I don't know. You compass me about. Yeah. So then the next part of the liturgy is, he, is, is, is verse five. So it says, I called upon the Lord in my distress. And then of course the response to that is going to be verse 25. And he says, they respond, save me now, Lord, I beseech thee, O Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. So you can see the calling, they're calling on God, right? And then the, the plea, the response to Lord, save me now, Lord, I beseech thee, I beseech thee, send now prosperity. The response is the next thing, the Lord answered me and set me free. So the Lord answered your response for salvation and he set you free. Now you'll notice here that not only is salvation, but freedom, the proclamation of freedom, again, is connected to the Feast of Tabernacles, just like I brought you yeah. into Deuteronomy 31. Now so we're in distress means a tight place. That's right. It's in a tight place. A place, a place that you're bound, right? You can't move. Mm -hmm. And then the King James actually says that he set he sets me in a large place, right? Wow. So yeah. the, yeah. he sets us free. He unbinds us. That's right. It's so, also a, a Jubilee message. That's right. Mm -hmm. And that's read in Deuteronomy 31, right? That the Feast of Tabernacles, the law is read on the Feast of Tabernacles in the year of release, in the year of the Jubilee. So the proclamation of freedom and the reading of the law and the feast celebration of the Feast of Tabernacles are all connected together with the Jubilee. Amen. So this is where you can see right here in the Psalm, uh, mm -hmm. the Lord answered and set me free. So then it says, then he says, um, I shall, I shall deceive, I shall see my desire upon them that hate me. This is verses 7 through 13, and all those verses would be read because actually, actually just describing uh, what they're trying to do to the Messiah to destroy him. Mm -hmm. And that's why uh, that is kind of compared with verses 22 and 23. That this is a day the Lord, the stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. This is marvelous in our eyes, but the Lord has done this, right? And that's actually describing. Um, Christ's experience on the cross that we know, but mm -hmm. also the idea that Jesus is being exalted as the head, and and what's happening is that the foes are rising up against him. Actually, the the desire here, the foes that are rising up against him to destroy him, that's actually the evil part of you and I, that is actually resisting his will of setting us free. I don't know if you've you've seen that mm -hmm. in yourself that there's a part of you that doesn't want to die. There's a part of you that wants to cling to sin. There's a part of you that doesn't want to be set free. And so there's a struggle there, right? It also also describes, by the way, by the way, that's represented by the wicked who surround the cross and were jeering at Christ and try to tempt him. Satan was using them to try to tempt him to come down, right? To cause him to fall. And you knew, you'll notice uh, if you look at the verses in Psalm 7, verses 7 through 13, it describes that experience. The Lord... I'll read them. The Lord taken my, taketh my part with them that, that help me. Therefore shall I see my desire upon them that hate me. Mm -hmm. It's better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in man. It is better to trust in the Lord than to put confidence in princes. All nations compass me about, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They compass me about, yea, they compass me about, but in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. They compass me about like bees. They are quenched as fire of thorns, for in the name of the Lord... <laughs> I will destroy them. Thou hast thrust sore at me that I might fall, but the Lord helps me. So you see the struggle between the struggle in us, between the righteousness, the, the evil in us, and our desire to be saved. You also see the struggle in, in terms of Christ and what happens, what's happening at the cross when they compassed him about. Right. Um, you also see here that, that what's prominent is the name of the Lord. It's in the name of the Lord. See, that's significant because the seal at the Feast of Tabernacles that is received by the bride is what? The name of the Lord. The name of her husband. That's right. 
the name of the bridegroom and the name of the bridegroom, the, our, the name of our bridegroom is Jesus Christ, our Lord. He's the, he's God. So the name of our bridegroom is actually the character of God. That's the seal that we receive mm -hmm. in the name of the Lord. So here in the Psalm, it describes the sealing taking place in terms of what Christ did when he won our salvation. And that's why that is chiastically paired with the stone which the builders rejected has become the head of the corner. So this has become the head, the, the word head, mm -hmm. rush, and that means he's the leader, he's the head mm -hmm. of all things, right? Um, I see a lot of imagery in Psalms too that go along with a lot of this, you know. That's right. That's right. And Psalm 2 is a coronation psalm. Yeah. That's right. Definitely. So then he does all of this. He does all of this for his name's sake. That's right. <laughs> so then you see, he says, the Lord is my strength and my song. He is become my salvation. So see, th this is become is, is a reference to the, the, the transition in administration of Christ. He is become right it's the same thing you see in the stone the builders rejected has become the head of the corner something has happened so here you see the lord strength in my song he is become my salvation by the way the word again for salvation is yeshua so it's jesus's name uh, he has become my jesus he has become the source of my salvation so of course chiastly paired with that he says the congregation says i will praise thee for thou hast heard me and art become my salvation so they they iterate, reiterate. <laughs> and then, of course, here's your joy, Jim, Jim, that you were talking about for the Feast of Tabernacles. The voice of rejoicing and salvation is in the tabernacles of the righteous. Amen. So there's your, there's your joy for the Feast of Tabernacles. And why is there joy? Well, the Caius Lee paired, because I shall not die, but I shall live and I shall declare the works of the Lord. How do you declare the works of the Lord? By, by being transformed that's right in his character by receiving yeah. his name and reflecting his character that's right you're because we become his bride and we're going to reflect mm. glory right that's then, the, by the way that's part of the ceremony right and john uh 6 29 helps us understand how that happens he says that the way to do the works of the lord is to believe on him who he has sent that's right it has to be in our faith in Christ. So then the, the psalmist ends, or brings the chiasm together, the right hand of the Lord doth valiantly. And then, of course, that phrase is repeated by the congregation, the right hand of the Lord doth valiantly. So who, who is the source of our salvation? Christ. On whom does our salvation depend? Christ. Christ. No one in the congregation is saying, look what I did. Right or right. look, I did my I I I I I achieved my own salvation. No, 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 no. All glory goes to all glory mm -hmm. goes to Christ. Right. So no, He's the one. The right hand of the Lord has done valiantly, no, and He both. holds us in His right hand. <laughs> That's right. And we are the fruit that Jim was talking about that is held yes. at the right That's hand. Right. That's right. Which is said three times. That's right. The pleasure of the Lord. Shall prosper in his hand, Isaiah 53. Mm -hmm. That's right. <laughs> yeah, That's Isaiah right. And, and, and it's the, the arm it's, of the Lord that brings us salvation, right? Isaiah is going to talk about that. And the arm of the Lord is always the kingship. That's the king, mm -hmm. right? So this is all kingly image mm -hmm. stuff. And then, of course, the top of the chiastic structure I already mentioned the right hand of the Lord is exalted. So you can see. What's beautiful about this is that, first of all, you can see the kingship imagery, you can see the Feast of Tabernacles imagery, the marriage imagery, the name going to the bride, the tabernac tabernacling together, the proclamation of freedom that's connected with the, the public declaration of God's law. There's a water ceremony, there's a light ceremony. All this stuff is wrapped into the Psalm 118. This is all beautiful imagery. By the way, this is why... This is why this psalm is what is quoted in Matthew 21 at the triumphal entry. Because remember, they're waving the palm branches and, and they're crowd, shouting Hosanna, right? And then, then the, the people, the, the children are saying, blessed is you comes. In, why, are they, why, why are they quoting Psalm 118? They know. It's fulfilled. That's right. 
well, as the spirit of God is moving and, the, and God is doing something so that we'll see. And this is where Jesus, when, when this is what actually when Psalm the stone which the builders has rejected has become the capstone, that was also, that, that is also quoted in, in Matthew 21 at the triumphal entry. When they, when the, when the priests are challenging Jesus about shutting people up and he's not the Messiah, then, so this whole Psalm is actually brought in and, and the, at the at Matthew 21, of course, we we talked a little bit about that. Matthew 21 is the beginning of the week, the final week, the closing of probation for God for the for the leadership of Israel in terms of accepting or rejecting the Messiah. So this is critical a critical time. Anyway, I don't want to add too much more on top of it, but you can see you can see the beauty of the Caiaphatic structure and the meaning of the Psalm. Abram raised his hand unto the Lord of the Most High after he defeated the kings of the north. That's right. That's right. And that's how the oaths are taken. By the way, what's the word for oath, Craig? Tell them. Shavua. That's is, right. Uh, it? It's a form of the number seven. It's seven. It means to that's seven true. oneself. That's right. So to take an oath like is to seven, off. right? So an oath, <laughs> an oath is sacred. Because it's a seven. And by the way, the oath is a completion. So when, when they raise their hands to heaven and they take the oath, they're, they're, they're taking a seven. They're, the, but the idea is completion. So when Melchizedek does that, the same thing that, that uh, you see the angel in Revelation 10 do or the, or, or the angel in Revelation 12, Daniel 12, when they lift their hands and take the oath, that's, a, that's seven. And what they're doing is that they're, they're, their words are supposed to be connected to the throne of God. And that means that they're absolute and they're, they're not unchangeable. The, the Lord has swear, sworn and he shall not repent. He's a priest after the order of Melchizedek. That's right. So he's first, the, first king of righteousness and then king of peace. That's right. He does not change. It's interesting so, if you understand a little bit about a, a Jewish wedding, you can see a lot of the imagery. That's right. Absolutely. Still carried over today. You know, a woman walks around the husband seven times. That's right. And they get married under a a booth. Yeah. That's right. That's yeah. right. It's because all that wedding imagery. That's right, because it's the Feast of Tabernacles. They're That's tabernacles. right. That's right. So the wedding has always been a symbol of mm -hmm. the salvation of God. And, That's right. And really, the, the husband would go away and prepare a place for her. She didn't That's know right. when he was coming exactly. That's but right. He would, he would say, I, I'm going to go and prepare a place for you. And then I'm going to come back and receive you under myself. That's right. That's right. As quite, Christ was quoting that mm -hmm. basically because he was bringing in that bridegroom idea to bring you with me. That's and right. All the groom's family and all of his entourage would come with him. She was just to always be ready. Get ready because you don't know exactly. But then you, of course, see the signs that he's coming. You know, you can That's right. It, it shows that how... do that in a wedding now. You know, they still lift them up on a chair. That's right. <laughs> right? It, They're being exalted. They're being lifted up. That's right. And yeah. It shows that, that, that the, the husband was the focus of mm -hmm. the Jewish wedding. Unlike today, where everything is all about the bride. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah that's right. The bride, and then they go together. That's right, and the and the and the and the wedding feast lasted seven days. And seven then days. Eighth, then the eighth day, I believe. When was the consummation? Somewhere. Yeah, uh, that the speci that specific. I, I'm not sure. I I I think that actually the consummation happened all that week. But uh, you know, the point is, is that the the wedding feast lasted seven days. Yeah. Right. The, the procession that went to the altar, they went around the altar seven times, the mm. burnt altar, with the bows that's, and the fruit. That's right. So all this imagery actually blends together, which is so beautiful. That's right. So, Song of Solomon, chapter three. <laughs> yep. Crowned on yep. the day of his espousals. Yep, the king is coronated on the day of his wedding. That's correct. That's right. You know, we think about the Jubilee how it affects us and how happy we are but really it's more about the king he's been waiting a long time for the bride he's been waiting and waiting and we've disappointed him 
And you think about it where it says in Hebrews, it was the joy that was set before him that he endured the cross. And, you know, how, how much he longed to be with us, how much he longed to have his bride. Um, right. And his heart is broken. For his namesake. Right. Finally, he has his bride. That's right. That's right. Amen. And her interest is for the, for the groom, not for herself. That's right. By the way, that's what's going on in Revelation 14. Mm -hmm. As God's Revelation. people, interest will be for the groom. We're not like, like Pastor Whelan used to say, you know, some of us are like the flower girl. We just want the cake. But, the, <laughs> you know, we want the reward. But that's, but Christ's bride is thinking about the groom. What she's willing to take of her cross. That's right. Because, he, because he is the reward. He is the reward. He, there is no other reward. <laughs> he is the reward. Every all the blessings come from him. And she all, is the reward. All all life flows from the king, right? Remember the Nebuchadnezzar, the tree in, in, in Daniel 4, right? Everything in his kingdom gets life from that tree, right? Yeah. So he's the king is the source of life. That's where the, the whole water rain imagery, the, the ladder rain and the river of life imagery, that river of life comes from the rock, that stone the builders rejected. When that rock is struck, living water comes from that rock, right? He's the source of life. He's the tree of life. He's the river of life. He's the light of life. He's the word of life. He's the bread of life. He, you know, you just, we're going to, for eternity, we're going to be looking at all these symbolism saying, yep, that's Jesus. Yep, that's Jesus. Yep, he's everything. He yeah. is literally everything. It's all about him. And we become we become reflections of his character. We mm -hmm. become sons and daughters of God. Like right? the moon reflects the sun. That's right. And that's the, that's you know, that's the, the beauty of the Feast of Tabernacles. That it's it's all about worshiping the king, the king is the beholding the king in his beauty. It's just this awesome stuff. Now, the light ceremony and the water ceremonies. Most Adventists do not understand when they talk about the latter rain, or they talk about the earth being lit with, with God's glory, the loud cry. They don't understand that those things, those events do not happen. They will, they, they, they happen in the context of Christ being king. That's, that's what they have. That's what's going on. And when we see these things, we're supposed to know that he has become king. And in the Psalm, he says, uh, verse two says, let Israel now say, and then again, let the house of Aaron now say, let them now mm -hmm. fear the Lord say. And that's why he said, I, I stressed is become, and he is in the tabernacles that he has become our salvation. He is become the head of the corner. This is the day that the Lord has made. This is the time and space that the light of God is shining for us to see the glory of the, of the, of the righteous one, the source of all light. Amen. That's what, this is the day he has made. That's the day of the Lord that we say we look forward to. Amen. So it's important it cometh in the name of the Lord. It's Go important to all, no, I'm sorry. It's important to uh, remember that there was a lot of blood shared from 13 bulls yeah. to two rams to 14 lambs to a goat, and successively it went down to 12 bulls and two rams and 14 lambs and one goat, and it kept yeah. down. There was a lot of blood poured out on this feast of salvation and joy um yeah tremendous amount uh that was offered up uh, goes down till it gets to seven that's right right till right. it gets to seven that's right seven two fourteen and one yep and it's interesting the fourteen and the one never change right of course Part of what's going on yeah. there is that the the idea of of the sac those sacrifices was part of the feast that they were partaking of those sacrifices in the feast so they were literally just like passover they were eating the sacrifice as part of the feast so they were literally partaking in the sacrifice of christ and becoming one you know taking for yes, yes. the marriage because whenever you get married there's always a marriage supper to consummate the wedding right so there's a meal this is the message to Laodicea. You know, Christ is standing at the door knocking. If we would open the door, he would come in and sup with us. See, that's that's intimacy. That's the wedding, the, the, the consummation of the covenant. So the feast 
had to do that the the animals being sacrificed were were not only part of the imagery of the sacrifice of Christ but they were part of the sacrifice of the feast and the and the meal the wedding meal that consummated this the 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 relationship and they were to bring a gift as as within your means and how God has blessed you you're to bring a gift that's right everyone was to bring a gift according to the blessings of God right. so what does that mean yeah amen supposed to be doing is offering ourselves we're all supposed to be bringing ourselves and surrendering ourselves to the king that's why that's why they held the branch right? and then they were supposed to put the branch they were supposed to come under the branch remember yep um, they come under the fig tree well they're supposed to stand under that branch because you're a subject of the king so you're subject you're under him he's the king he's the standard of right he's the law he's the judge i'm subject i'm his subject so i become under him that's what it means to understand it means to stand under it means, it means to subject myself to and so if i if we understand then we will stand under we'll subject ourselves to the king and we become his subject we become his body his bride whichever level you want to describe and that's all part of that's why you lived in booth for lived into the booth and slept under the branches for seven days that's the feast of booths i heard brian say a living sacrifice that's right. and acceptable to god which is your reasonable service that's amen right. and, and also the, the 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 14 that never changed that's two sevens <laughs> that's right that's right brian did you have something you well, uh, that's just what I was going to say is I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's right. That's right. That's the, the sacrifice, the, the gift that we bring. And the total transformation of mind that happens there in verse 2. You, be would, not conformed, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Would you like you to may prove what he has to say about this? I'm sorry. Amen. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, I was just quoting verse Yeah, two. yeah, yeah. Mm. No, that's fine. I didn't mean to interrupt you, brother. No, please. <laughs> read what I was going to read what, what Mrs. White says in Patriarchs and Prophets about this. She says, in the seventh month came the Feast of Tabernacles. This is Patriarchs and Prophets, chapter 51. It says, in the seventh month came the Feast of Tabernacles, or of ingathering. This feast acknowledged God's bounty in the products of the orchard, the olive grove and the vineyard it was the crowning festival the crowning festival gathering of the year interesting she uses the word crowning huh mm -hmm. i've been uh, harvesting <laughs> <laughs> on the feast of tabernacles very good so it's the crowning festival so she talks about crowning which is so these insights are neat so the land had yielded its increase. The harvest had been gathered into granaries. The fruits, the oil, and the wine had been stored. The first fruits had been reserved. By the way, reserved for who? The priest. The king. King. Yeah, the king. It's the king's harvest, right? So the first fruits had been reserved. They're always reserved for the king. And then now the people came with their tributes of thanksgiving to God, who had thus richly blessed them. The feast was to be preeminently an occasion of rejoicing. It occurred just after the great day of atonement when the assurance had been given that their iniquity should be remembered no more. At peace with God, they, they now came before him to acknowledge his goodness and to praise him for his mercy. The labors of the harvest being ended and the toils of the new year not begun, the people were free from care and could give themselves up to the sacred joyous influences of the hour. The, though only the father... Though only the fathers and sons were commanded to appear at the feast, yet as far as possible, all the household were to attend them. And to their hospitality, the servants, the Levites, the stranger, and the poor were made welcome. Like Passover, the Feast of Tabernacles was commemorative. In memory of their pilgrim life in the wilderness, the people were now to leave their houses and dwell in booths or arbors formed from the green boughs of the goodly trees and the palm branches and the boughs of thick clouds and the willows of the brook. The first day was a holy convocation, and to seven days, the seven days of the feast, and the eighth day was added, which was observed in like manner. These, at these yearly assemblies, the hearts of old and young would be encouraged in the service of God, while the association of the people from the different quarters of the land would strengthen the ties that bound them to God and to one another. Then she says this, 
well it would be for the people of God at the present time to mm -hmm. have the Feast of Tabernacles, a joyous commemoration of the blessings of God to them. As children of Israel celebrated the deliverance that God had wrought for their families and his mar marvelous preservation of them during their journeyings from Egypt, so should we gratefully call to mind the various ways he has devised for bringing us out from the world, out from the darkness of error, into the precious light of his grace and his truth. I read that. Where is that again? Patriarchs That's and Patriarchs Prophets. and Prophets, page uh, chapter 51. It's actually chapter oh, by 52. By the way, what, what's that? It's actually chapter 52. Oh, is it? My, I'm yeah. sorry. My, That's all right, because I just chapter... looked it up. And then... Okay, it says it's page, page 540. <laughs> is that correct? Yeah, page 540, correct. Okay. So it's what's interesting is that she says we should be keeping the Feast of Tabernacles. By the way, we do, but most Adventists don't understand, right? Camp meeting. What do we, what, what do, we do at camp meeting? What are we supposed to be doing at camp meeting? Dwelling in booths. We're supposed to go and dwell in, in Succoth. The word Succoth means booth. It means a tent. It means a temporary dwelling. And how long is camp meeting? Ten days. Well, it's supposed to be seven. It's supposed to be seven or eight days, right? Yeah. You say it starts Friday right. and ends the next Sabbath. But so the whole point is a camp meeting is an an Adventist tradition because at our our founders were were steeped in biblical theology, and all the people were supposed to come and celebrate the Feast of Tabernacles, and that's what camp meeting was all about. Was all about. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But of course, most people don't understand what camp meeting is about anymore, and they don't don't even go. But anyway. So it's interesting the, of all the feasts, she says the Feast of Tabernacles is the one that we're supposed to be commemorating because that still has yet to be fulfilled. Yes. Will the Feast of Tabernacles be fulfilled? Be being fulfilled. <laughs> yeah, that's right. And what's the event? In her day, it was yet to be fulfilled. That's right. And what's the event? <laughs> the earthquake, the changing yeah, the of the government. Of the king. The crowning of the king. All, all the festal events have to do with Christ. And the event that is to take place that fulfills the Feast of Tabernacles is when he has become king. That's the event. And by the way, that's the event that we're supposed to be studying and celebrating and, and praising God and we're looking for and studying for when we come together at the Feast of Tabernacles at camp meeting. That's supposed to be the emphasis of camp meeting. To study the prophecies, to understand the, the coming of the king and the preparation for the coming of the king that is necessary. It's interesting that the you know Passover is the first feast and Tabernacles is the seventh, the last feast. So they they sort of uh, 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 there's this chiastic connection between them. That's right. And uh, you've got that you know the, you you were talking about how the sacrifices and. You, you see in Passover, but there were also the sacrifices connected to tabernacles. And, and of course, you see the Israelites tabernacling through the wilderness before they entered into the promised land after the Passover. Yeah. And we saw, you know, Christ was, Christ was coronated the first time at Passover, and he's coronated the second time in the Feast of Tabernacles. That's right. Yeah. In the middle of that chiasm is Pentecost, the fourth feast, the outpouring of the Spirit that comes with it, that helps us understand what these things mean. Right. Hey, Jeff, did you have a comment? Yeah. Could you, um, I did the chiastic between the verses 7 through 13 and the stone, which the, the builders rejected, and, and you, you spent a minute or two on that. But could you just elaborate a bit more on verses 7 through 13? You know, we've been talking about mercy and all these great things. And then three times, I will destroy them, I will destroy them, I will destroy them. Can, can you just elaborate on that, the 7 through 13? Just a moment? Yeah, yeah. So, so you'll notice that the idea here is that they said they compassed me about. They compass me about. They compass me about. What does that mean? It's circled around them. Right. Remember when Jesus described the abomination of desolation in Matthew 24? What did he say? That they're going to do what to the city? They're going to encompass it. 
they're going to encompass about the city, right? So the idea here, the see, the encompassing about is actually describing the synagoguing of Satan, the synagogue, the three parts of the kingdom that is resisting the true king. The three parts of that kingdom come together. That's what compassing about means. So the abomination of desolation has to do with the three parts of Satan's kingdom in place, and they try to they try to exercise their authority or their will. And so you'll see, for example, in the crucifixion of Christ, you see you see the Jew the Jewish people connect they they consort together with Pilate and with the Romans to kill Christ. So you see the Pharisees and the Sadducees uniting together to crucify Christ. So you see this, this compassing about is actually the synagoguing of Satan or the coming together of the three parts of his kingdom to try to destroy Christ and to, to, to kill his anointed, to, to use Psalm 2, right? So the point here, actually, it's, yeah, Psalm 110. So the point here is that when they're compassing him about, the idea is that because they rejected light and truth, instead of maturing in righteousness, now they're going to mature in evil. And that's where this abomination of desolation is the result of rejecting Christ as their king. That's why he says the stone that the builders rejected becomes the capstone, or he becomes the king. And because they rejected him as their king, then they, they remember, we have no king but Caesar. 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 And so in, in, in AD 70, who comes to destroy the city? Well, the very king that they chose, right? They chose Caesar as their king. And who comes to destroy the city? Well, the Romans do. Well, they made themselves subject to this king, and now they're going to they're going to receive the de the desolation, the destruction that comes from from the king that they've chosen because they they rejected the king of life, so they they accepted another king, and that king is not going to be able to give them life. So this this compassing him about is connected to the three parts of Satan's kingdom coming together, coalescing together, synagoguing together mm -hmm. to try to to, to try to, to to kill the Lord and His anointed to try to destroy the kingdom of God. But it's, it's not going to happen. And it's a, a counterfeit of the truth. The, the people who are accepting Christ are encompassing about Christ, the true king. That's right. around and the they, king. That's right. And so there's, a, there's the, the, the synagoguing of God, his right, rightful kingdom. And there's a synagogue of Satan, the, the false kingdom. And those two kingdoms now are Armageddon, Armo A. They're, 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 in, they're in direct conflict with each other. And that's what's going on. Here. That's why he says... It's better to trust in the Lord than put confidence in man. It's better to trust in the Lord than put confidence in man. Right? He, he, he just cut off. He was cut off out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people. And who shall declare his generation? It was he who was cut off. That's right. So he we wouldn't have off. to be. That's right. So we wouldn't have to be. Right? Exactly. Exactly. So, and so the, the sad part is, is all those people that reject him that are now being cut off, he was already cut off for them. Right. All they have to do is accept his, his sacrifice, and they don't have to be cut off. But because, they're, because of their pride and their willingness to accept him as a sacrifice, now they have to bear their, their, their own transgression. And they're going to be, they're, that's why he says they become his enemies, and they're going to be destroyed. And he will destroy them. <laughs> And that's why he says that he says that three times. In the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. Again, in verse verse ten, again eleven. In the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. And then in verse twelve, in the name of the Lord, I will destroy them. What's going to happen to the wicked when Christ comes? They'll be destroyed. Yes. And and well, how are they destroyed? What what destroys them? They're so they ask for the rocks right. and the mountains. They ask for the rocks and the mountains to hide their faces from the one who sits on the throne. They ask for destruction. That's right. From the glory of the Lord. It's the glory of the Lord that destroys them. Right. It's as they're clinging to their sins. It's not that he kills them per se, but they refuse they, to be that's right. from their sins. And sin and God cannot coexist. So it's inevitable. Yes. That's right. So they chose... They chose non-existence. But the point here is the same thing that is a blessing to you and I, the glory of the Lord, to them is destruction, but to, what is, to us it is a blessing. And by the way, the glory of the Lord hasn't changed. No. The glory of the Lord isn't different for them as it is for me. No, no. The, 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 the difference is the, the choices and the decisions that were made. 
I accepted his forgiveness. I accepted my sin. I acknowledged my sin and accepted his forgiveness. Therefore, his glory is a blessing to me. But if I reject his forgiveness and I cling to my sin, then that glory is going to be destruction to me. Right. I, it's, it's our choices that cause, that bring the result. But the salvation comes from him. Right. That's where his mercy endures forever for all. That's right. So that's, that's my, my explanation. Mm. Notice it's verse 7 and verse 13 is, is uh, kindly paired by this idea that the Lord helped me. Right? Mm. Here's the stone their builders rejected is saying that the Lord helped me. So no, in other words, Jesus is on the cross <laughs> trusting in his Father. Right? Yes. He didn't exercise his own divine of power and authority no he he submit he surrendered himself to his father and he trusted in his father that's what he did and that's what we're to do to surrender ourselves to our king and to trust in our king so we're going to have the same three levels of evil coming against us we see it all through revelation that's right just like the three levels of evil in us there's going to be three levels of evil against us that's right So I don't know if that, does that help, Jeff? Oh, no, that, that's, thank you very much. No, that's kind of what I was thinking. I just, just needed to hear it spread out a little bit. Thank you. Why, why did you leave verses eight and nine out of that chiasm? How did you come up with that? Just didn't I, didn't, I didn't leave them out in my explanation, but I just, I just. I know, you, you talked to me in the explanation, just on the, on the PDF you sent. Yeah, I'm. I'm. I just threw it together, and then there's. There's. You can do it. You can put together a more uh, detailed chiastic structure. Uh, there's more details here that I didn't gather. I just okay. threw this together quickly for this talk tonight, so you could see it. But yeah, I'm. I'm sure there's lots of things I left out. Amen. But I didn't leave it out for. There was no purposeful. I just. Okay, that was my question. Yeah. Yeah. So, anyways, that that's what I wanted to share with you guys about the Feast of Tabernacles. And uh, hopefully as you continue to study more, you'll start seeing uh, the Feast of Tabernacles more and more in terms of uh, other places in scripture as well. Also, for those of you that are, there's more uh, verses 19 and 20. I didn't spend a lot of time with. Um, oh yeah. The whole idea of the, see that there's a festal procession yeah. But see, the confusion here is that there's a festival procession that goes into the sanctuary. There's also a festival procession coming out of the sanctuary. And um, so first 19 and 20, which I didn't mention at all, and I didn't purposely leave them out for because they're not important because they are, um, deals with this gate of this, this festival procession going through the gate. As you already know, um, the gate is the place of the coronation. The gate is also the place of the, where the capstone is placed. Um, so the festival procession, the king goes in his gate and he also comes out his gate and there is a festival procession. And when at, at the end of the Psalm, he says, um, with bows in hand, join the festival procession. That's verse 27 up to the horns of the altar. So again, there's another whole talk about the importance of the horns of the altar connected to, uh, the feast of tabernacles, which by the way, actually binds this to the ending part, the, the last part of the Day of Atonement where the blood is placed on the horns of the altar. But so, so the point here is that that gate is actually kingship imagery. And you can go to Psalm 24 yeah. when it talks about the procession and the, at the gate. And then there's this, this discussion back and forth. You know, yes. the, the procession comes to the gate and they say, and the, and the people saying, the king of glory, the king of glory. And the people at the gate say, who is this king of glory? Right. And then there's this response with well, the Lord Almighty. He's the king of glory. Right. And so this re response is back and forth. And, the, and this response is, is awesome because they're proclaiming the, the glory of this king and mm -hmm. why he has the right to come through this gate. Right. Well, that's that's verses 19 and 20. That's what it's talking about. You know, yeah. if you've ever been to some of these other countries, like I've been to places around the world, you like Titus's gate, you know, they, they would build a triumphant gate just so they could walk through it, so they could show that they were conquering that city. If That's you look right. at Titus's arch, he's got emblems on it. You can see even to this day of the menorah and things that they took from Babylon 
You know, he had this arch that he marched through to say, right. this is my territory, this is mine. Yep. That's and right. The, and the gate was also a symbol of judgment. The king That's always right. sat down to judgment in the gate, and he's the one who determined True. who was righteous that had a, a right to follow him and enter in through the gate. True. That's that right. connects, that, that connects the Day of Atonement with the Feast of Tabernacles. Wow. That's right. And that gate, by the way, is actually, the, the, those gate, those pillars are living pillars. So the two trees on either side of the river, that's the gate. That's the gate of God. And you, the, the king is on the one side and the priest is on the other. And then the throne on, in the middle, that's God himself. That's a gate. So the Garden of Eden, the Tree of Life, that's a gate. The, oh, wow. the that we talk about, that's a gate. Zechariah 4 and Zechariah 6, they, that's a gate. The two witnesses in Revelation 11, that's a gate. You know, these are the door. Jesus says, I am the door, right? So when we talk about him being the, the bread of life and the tree of life and the light of life and the living water, he's also the gate. He's the door. True. So that's well, all yeah. the symmetry is. It's it's the same. All lifting up the gates and bringing them to the front of the, the top of the hill, you know? That's right. So in other words, he conquered that domain is what he's saying. Samson. But That's right. uh, Nehemiah, Nehemiah wanted the gates closed because of uh, the traffic and merchandise that was coming through on the Sabbath day. Yeah, he That's right. that the gates be closed. And it's, isn't it interesting? That's what was when when that when that was the last thing to be restored because that was the first thing that the, the people that didn't want Jerusalem to be to be rebuilt wanted to be to stay destroyed because. Yeah gate is destroyed then they have then there's no there's no authority there there's no access there's no way to keep anything out or keep anything in yeah it's that's interesting how the gates are open of course you have the 12 tribes on each of those gates but that's, the, the gates that's right. are open but they're closed when the wicked are wanting to surround the city to take over yeah, and those gates, by the way, there's the twelve tribes are one side, one part of the gate, and the twelve yeah. apostles are the other, right? Those are living gates, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. See, that's the imagery of Daniel eight again. That's the imagery that we've been talking about, about the river and the two witnesses on either side, and this fighting for this position by the tree of life, by by the river of life. That's their they're fighting for the kingship of this world. That's what they're fighting over. Mm -hmm. But when the true king takes his place, <laughs> there's, there's that's going to be the, the end of that discussion. That's right. Hallelujah. Amen. <laughs> those those gates also refer to our own brain in what we let in and what we don't let in. That's right. That's right. Amen. That's uh, exactly I correct. Before my eyes, Job, no yeah. vile thing. I think a television. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Yep. So this this is just beautiful imagery. It's just a feast of tabernacle is just amazing stuff. Um, really and it's amazing all these years that we have been so blind to it. Of course, now it's time, right? Now That's right. Time. So it's now increase of knowledge. Yep. Us to wake up and. Mm -hmm. You know that the, that's what the latter rain is. The latter rain is the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, that which is connected to the coronation of the King, that that awakens God's people to the truth of the Word of God, because the Word of God, the living Word of God, is the King Himself. And yeah. so, the whole idea of the latter rain, the outpouring of the Spirit, is what is that the Word of God comes to life in His people, and I begin to see the Scripture through new eyes. I begin to see what it's literally saying. It's a living Word of God it becomes alive. What, what did Jesus say at the beginning of his seven? He said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent ye and believe the gospel. That's Just right. Just like there's a declaration. Of the three angels message. Seven. <laughs> That's right. Time is fulfilled. Yeah. The time of the king. Well, we're living in exciting times. Amen. We are. It's a wonderful time to be alive. Yeah. Even though we are distressed and persecuted and hated, <laughs> still a wonderful time. Yeah. How many of our pioneers and all our prophets? Well, and the thing, 
the it, thing is how they how they treated our king is what we are to expect how they're going to treat us amen yeah. and if we expect anything different then we're not in touch with our king no yeah. and it's because his presence is with us that's that's why they treat us that way and and that's why it's still a blessing it's because and that's why all the prophets long to to live in that time is because that's we right. have that special access to the presence of the lord with us the mm -hmm. conquering king yes yeah. yeah right something becomes yeah. available to us through him that has not been available before mm -hmm. yeah through, through his kingly anointing that's yeah. right yeah. So, so this is where you know people have talked about this for 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 centuries about the hundred forty four thousand. How come they they can be special and you know are these these people pulling themselves up by the bootstraps? Is that why they're special? No, no, no. Something is available to them that wasn't available before because there was an experience that Christ was to have that would and that experience was now available to them. Well, okay. that's what this this is what they're this is what the experience that's available to one hundred forty four thousand. It's the marriage of the Lamb. It's the kingship of Christ. And now something is available to them that wasn't available before. They're going to have an experience that nobody else has had. That's yeah. right. That's yeah. why they only do, they, they sing the same song that no one knows and understands but them because it's an experience that only they have had. That's right. And they have his name, the father's name on their forehead. And they're virgins. This is the marriage imagery. Yeah. Right? Acts 3.19. Repent and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. That's right. Mm -hmm. The conclusion of the Day of Atonement mm -hmm. leading into the Feast of mm -hmm. Tabernacles when the sins are actually blotted out because his presence is the with us. That's right. And he tabernacles in us. We, we, we come under his we come under his branch under his under the shadow of his beams his wings christ yes. in you the hope of glory amen good amen. now hope does not disappoint because the love of god has been poured out in our hearts by the holy spirit who was given to us amen. that's romans 5 5 and then farther down in Romans 5.10, he says, we shall be saved by his life. Amen. He pours, he pours his life into us. If we will confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, to transform our characters, mm -hmm. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Yes. Yeah, we're, we're reconciled by his death, but we're saved by his life. Amen. Amen. Well, living blood in us. We need that transfusion. To be born again. Eat my flesh and drink my blood. Let this well, mind that is in Christ Jesus be also in each of us. So what I would encourage you, if you're interested in understanding the book of Revelation... That you should go read it again in the context of the Feast of Tabernacles, mm -hmm. and it will become a whole new book to you. Amen. Amen. All the all the things, all the types of the past that we have seen in the past are still true, but the true revelation of the King is not in the past; it's in the present and the future. And therefore, the Book of Revelation is in the present and in the future. It's not. It's not just in the past. Of course, it's the eternal gospel, so obviously it's in all place and all time. But the point is that if you study the book of Revelation in the context of the Feast of Tabernacles, you will you will see see new revelations of of Christ. Anti typical view. That's right. In light of the Feast of Tabernacles. That's one of the things that I've been doing with the book of Daniel, which is why I'm sharing you the things that I've been sharing with Daniel. It's the same thing. And when you look at when you look at something in the light of Christ, in light of his king, king, kingly ministry, you see it one way. When I look at it in terms of his priestly ministry, I see it another way. When I look at it in terms of his preaching, teaching ministry, I see it a different way. When I see it, when I look at it in terms of him as a sacrifice, the Lamb of God, I see it a different way. So every time I look at the same scripture through the, through, through the diamond of Christ and, and from a different perspective, it, it shows new beauty, new light. That's the new light that Mrs. White was talking about. Dear Heavenly Father, we just the love that would not let us go. Thank you so much for your word. Thank you for your living word. Father, we just adore you and we 
We thank you for sending your son to die for us. We thank you for his life, his death, and his resurrection. And Lord, we so want to be your servants, to be subject to you, to be your bride, to be to do all that we do and say to glorify you. Just bless us to this end. Father, you have called each of us for a purpose. And there's other lives that we are to touch, that we are to influence for your kingdom. So please bless us, empower us, give us wisdom to understand and to stand under the king and to do all that we can to glorify you and lift up, lift you up. Just bless us, Father. Pour your Holy Spirit upon us. Give us the mind of Christ. Give us the heart of Christ. May we, may we wear the robe of your righteousness and shine light in this dark world that they may know the king of glory and see the king in his beauty. Just bless us. Uh, in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.